Today's episode of The Bitcoin Show is brought to you by usgoldcoins.com, 1-800-HOT-COIN, and Meze Grill, M-E-Z-E Grill.com, and TradeHill.com, and MTGox.com, M-T-G-O-X.com. Everybody, welcome to the Bitcoin Show. This is episode 31. We're bringing it to you fast and furious. Sometimes we're doing two <laughs> shows a day because there's so much breaking news all the time. I, you know, I'm Bruce Wagner. This is Manny Man, of course. My cohort, cohort in uh, Bitcoin non-crime. Uh, we, you know, only only cash is used for crime, and this is not about crime. This is about Bitcoin. So anyway, today's uh, uh, quick uh, extra special bulletin update is about the Douala situation. <clears throat> they don't want me to call it a crisis. Um, I say, you know, if there's tens of thousands of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars, it's, it's a crisis to me. I mean, I don't know how many thousands of dollars it takes for you to call it a crisis, but it's pretty darn important. But we'll just call it a situation. So here's the story. I, I want to bring, bring you up to date here. Um, this is... Um, you know, as you heard, if you if you heard our episode, what was it, 28, um, 29, the the one where we talked about uh, when we had the the Trade Hill guys mm -hmm. on talking about that was this, 28, 28 okay, mm -hmm. about the the Douala situation, um, we actually ha uh, played some phone calls, uh, one where the Trade Hill guys were trying to get a hold of Douala, and they were just absolutely not mm -hmm. getting through, unavailable. They've been trying for two weeks, they say. Mm -hmm. And uh, no one could be, I mean, the, the customer service guy uh, who answered the phones just could not reach the CEO or the COO, just absolutely unreachable in this teeny tiny little startup. Okay, it'd be like the three of us in the room and I just can't reach Manny. I don't mm -hmm. know where he's at for two weeks now. So anyway, and, and Manny's Been the there. CEO of the company, whatever. Okay, so that, be that as it may. Then we, we showed you how, like, m like minutes later, really like 30 minutes later about, um, I called myself and I didn't say who I was. I just called their customer service number and um, asked, can transactions uh, that have been cleared be reversed? If I'm a merchant, can cleared transactions uh, mm -hmm. actually ever get reversed or charged back? And uh, they said, no, cleared transactions cannot be reversed. And then you hear the whole conversation as it went on and on and on. Just go back to listen to episode 28, was it, about oh, that? Yes. Because uh, you'll hear the whole conversation in length and decide for yourself. But basically they said no. They're still saying no as of episode 28 that day. Um, that no, clear transactions cannot be reversed. Well, actually, their policies apparently can be reversed. And their banks, their statements that they give to merchants after they've been published can be reversed, mm -hmm. I don't know. So here's the story. Um, this is obviously very disconcerting for anybody who uses Douala. Um, all right, so I'm just gonna read to you. Um, I, I just decided to write an open letter. This was six hours ago, 9.26 a.m. I uh, wrote this letter to Douala and I said, this is my open letter to Douala and I actually posted it in the forum and I, I sent it to, uh, to Douala as well as uh, you know, putting it everywhere. So um, here it is. If you bring up my screen, you'll, you'll probably be able to read along like a little karaoke. Uh, this is my open letter to Douala. I said this. I said, I again, employ, em, no, I again implore your CEO and COO to come on my show and explain their side of things. Several of their largest customers are all claiming the same things. Hiding under a rock will only make things worse much worse. Life uh, always works that way. I implore them to both come onto my show and explain their side of things. Like it or not, the Bitcoin world will make or break your business. The Bitcoin community makes up so, such a large percentage of your business. We have no animosity toward Dwala. As you can see, I've made many mentions and even pro, uh, promotional videos on YouTube of how to use Dwala. The only animosity anyone has is when you hide and avoid talking. Come out with the whole truth publicly, apologize if and where appropriate, and the world will be in love with Dwala again. Or hide out, speak only through attorneys, and I predict a very, very short life for Dwala. 
Uh, life has much bias towards honesty, transparency, and humility. Um, and that's my letter, my open letter to Dwala. Well, um, as I said, besides posting it, I actually uh, went ahead uh, and sent it directly to them, and I got a reply. Okay, so this was at 9.26 a.m. Now I flip over to, uh, to my reply, uh, to their reply to me. And this comes from Dwala Support uh, two minutes later, right? Mm-hmm. 9.26, 9.28. Yep, two minutes later uh, this morning. And so uh, Dwala replies and says, Bruce, thank you for your email. Dwala does not for any reason release transaction information on any user account in a public forum or to reporters. I think you'll find any information regarding the company's stance here with a link to a blog post dated uh, June 2011, okay, which was written by the CI- CEO. If you have any specific Dwala questions, I can assist you. Don't uh, hesitate to ask. Okay, so that's my, that was the reply. So, of course, I responded again, and I said, um, I'm certainly not asking for any information about any specific account holders. We are asking for a public statement addressing broad allegations from a large number of your customers. No one customer specifically. Those blog posts from three weeks ago say nothing about the current situation. Your opinion about Bitcoin, I'm, I'm referring to the CEO, Uh, addressing him. Your opinion about Bitcoin is only barely mildly amusing, but it certainly does not address the very serious issues at hand. You really need to come out with a response regarding the claims of malfeasance by many of your largest customers. Simply attempting to rewrite history and then hide is not the winning strategy here, trust me. And I am, again, I implore you to address the Bitcoin community with the respect they deserve as the vast majority of your customers. Bitcoin users are not just morons buying truckloads of rotting bananas as your blog posts like to clearly imply. If you read his blog post, you'll see what I'm talking about. And answer their concerns about, number one, stating all along that cleared transactions are irreversible. Two, reversing old posted and cleared transactions on old statements and telling no one. Three, not communicating the fact that you are doing or have done that to the affected merchants for being unreachable to your largest customers for weeks at a time, very apparently avoiding all of their calls. Five, changing the online FAQ, support pages, etc. only after all of this has come to light. Addressing these five questions directly to the Bitcoin community, your customers would go a very long way toward saving your company's reputation, I highly recommend you allow me at least a telephone interview to hear you out on these five basic questions the world wants to know about Dwala's general operating policies. Okay, so that's what I sent back. That was at 10.14 a.m. and I had a chance to reply. Okay, so then I got, and by the way, you know, some of, the, <laughs> some of these points, I mean, if you, if you read the actual blog posts, he only posts this um, this uh, information on the siliconpraerienews.com, a little uh, open blog where he, he this is from, uh, what, weeks ago, three, four weeks ago. Mm-hmm. And he Those talks guest about, post. yeah, as a guest post, right, on this blog for the local uh, area. And basically he's like, you know, just say, I don't know, he, he didn't say much at all, really. I mean, he just is explaining what Bitcoin is and kind of, I mean, to me, the tone of it was really mocking Bitcoin that, you know, you know, equating it to uh, buying a truckload of bananas that are just going to rot. I mean, people can buy whatever they want, blah, blah, blah. But um, it, it sounds like the tone to me is that he's just mocking Bitcoin. He's mocking Bitcoin buyers in the Bitcoin community when meanwhile it's what? What is it? Is it 90% of their business? You know, it's, it's interesting that his success is actually coming from those that he mocks. All right, whatever. Be that as it may, um, then... I received uh, another a reply to that. Okay, so this is uh, 11.38 a.m. Central Time. This is three hours ago. So I got this. Bruce, thank you for your continued communication. Is it too small? Can you read that? Let me make it bigger. There, how's that? Okay, so now maybe you can read it. Uh, Bruce, thank you for your continued communication. It appears there's a great deal of misunderstanding as the processes in place have always been there, and the rules that drive them through financial institutions have as well. Long term, our hope is we can make everything much easier to understand 
and we don't under and we don't underestimate our role in that. Okay. Uh, so, in response to question one, and let me just go back up here to question one, is stating all along that clear transactions are irreversible. This is what he answers to that. Duala had, and by the way, who's writing this? Let me go down, back down here. Well, it's not really signed, but I can only assume this is the CEO or the COO. Somebody uh, is responding to this, just Duala support. All right, so response to question one. Douala has always had a dispute process and a bank failure process. Both of these processes have been in place since we launched in Iowa in 2009. A Douala user can, cannot simply cancel a transaction within the Douala software. In a case where a transaction is reversed, it is due to an individual filing a reject directly with the financial institution attached to their Douala account. To clarify, there is a difference between credit debit card chargebacks versus disputes and returns. Douala does not have a credit card or debit card chargebacks as these pr platforms are not used by our system. Instead, Douala works with financial institutions and operates within the same set of rules as others in this field. We follow those gu guidelines very closely. So, you know, now I'm going to go back and go, what was the question again? Oh, yeah, the question was stating all along that clear transactions are irreversible. This sounds like a whole lot of doublespeak to me. I mean, I have to really interject here and say, he didn't answer the question at all. He's saying there's, there's always been a dispute process and we follow banking guidelines and mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. We don't take credit. We're not credit cards. Therefore, it's not called a chargeback. Well, anyway, that is a bunch of doublespeak in my opinion. When you're asked clearly, and I, we have it on tape in episode 28, you listen. We called Dwala and said, can cleared transactions be reversed? The answer was no. They go on later than, you know, I think they recognize my voice because as I said, after I hung up with him, within three minutes, I got a reply from uh, the, the, the customer service person who said he had spoken to the COO. So suddenly the CEO, COO is immediately available within three minutes of my phone call and replied. And um, now, you know, they're saying that um, really nothing. They're absolutely saying nothing. It sounds like a politician, doublespeak. They're talking about, oh, banking industry and la la la, financial institutions, we follow guidelines. They don't say anything about the fact that they were saying on their site and they were saying to anyone who asked, and I had asked, I mean, the day that I opened my account, the next day they called me and that was one of the things I said, can, as a merchant, can transactions be reversed? And they said no. And, and they said the same thing the other, you know, when was that, was that yesterday? The day yes. before. The day before. The <laughs> day before yesterday. I mean, they said the same thing. Today's Wednesday, right? I know, time, time flies. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, so anyway, uh, up until two days ago, they're still saying the same thing. No, if you ask them, transactions that have cleared cannot be reversed. So they, they didn't answer the question. All right, so let's move on. Uh, just a bunch of gobbledygook to not answer a question is not acceptable. Number two, reversing old posted and cleared transactions on old statements and telling no one. I mean, this is really, really bad. Um, I mean, serious allegations, shall we say. His answer, the transactions themselves all have a history. Okay, <laughs> whatever, we, I guess we know that. What we are learning is that people would like to see them are organized differently. And that is something we take very seriously. Um, I don't even know what that means. That, what, the columns should be sorted in a different way or they should <laughs> rearrange the fonts and the colors and the layout of the statement. This, th I mean, or are they meaning that they should actually go back and alter the actual numbers of historic transactions? This doesn't make sense to me. Anyway, keep going. Mm -hmm. We've also been getting direct feedback from users as to how they'd like to see them reflected. This two-way conversation is very useful to making merchants' lives easier in the long term. Okay, I sure hope so because, you know, reversing $40,000 of their transactions in a month is not making their life easier after they have been told that those cannot be reversed and then suddenly they are reversed without being notified. Okay, what we've moved towards is a more automated solution, which from recent feedback we believe will make my life much easier, especially when dealing with financial institutions. It will make whose life easier? What the heck? You said making life easier twice and people want to have the information organized differently. I have to say, I don't think that they're really asking for it to be organized differently. I think they're asking for it to be accurate and not changing, not fluid when we're talking about historical transactions. At least verbose so they can know what's going on. 
Yeah, I mean, the thing is, like, to, to <laughs> when, when you're told they can't be reversed, and then you're told that when you get an email, that then it's absolutely, definitely, positively cleared, and then you go back and look at previous statements and compare them to another copy of the, that same statement, and the numbers have changed. You know, the guys at Trade Hill, one of the guys at Trade Hill was saying, he actually saw the numbers change before his very eyes. He was looking at an HTML version of the thing, mm -hmm. and the numbers were changing right before his very eyes. You know, it's, yeah. oh my God, you can't just go back and rewrite history. So, um, basically, question number two, let's go back up here because I forgot what question number two was because it certainly had nothing to do with what he said. Reversing old posted and cleared transactions on old statements and telling no one. Yeah, he basically didn't say anything about that. People would like their transactions, their statements organized differently. May, does not answer the question, completely avoids the question. All right, now, question number three. Not communicating the fact that you're doing that or have done that to affected merchants. So it's kind of like reiterating the fact that not only are they saying you went back and changed historical statements, but you didn't even bother to tell anybody. It like, like almost like you were doing it and, and hoping no one would notice. Not cool. Okay, so is their answer to that is, while we cannot post merchant information or communication history publicly, of course not. We do have full records of communication for these types of issues with any and all merchants. We're happy to support anyone and everyone inside the customer service channels. Okay, what does that mean? It's supposed to say, oh, that means that they can prove that they did communicate these transactions to Mt. Gox, Trade Hill, all these sites that have been, ex uh, have been affected by this. You know, the sites are saying that they have been affected by this. To one extent or another, many of the exchange sites have now come forward and said, wow, upon uh, taking a much closer look, you're right, this has been happening. Uh, Mt. Gox says entire blocks of transactions have disappeared. Um, you know, and you know, it, a lot of exchanges have, have had this, or they're reporting basically the same stuff. And obviously, um, they're saying that they, this has not been communicated to them because if it had been communicated to them, they wouldn't all be surprised and coming mm -hmm. forward right now. I mean, that, that makes no sense. So if you can prove that you did communicate this to the merchants, um, you know, before, during, or after, then uh, you really need to do that because the merchants are saying, you know, this, these are representing, you know, the vast majority of your customers are saying the opposite. It just doesn't look good. All right, moving on. So question number four. Four, I think we're on. Let's see here. Question four is what? Here, uh, being unreachable to your target cust to your sorry, being unreachable to your largest customers for weeks at a time. Very apparently avoiding all of their calls. I mean, you know, Trade Hill said that they've been trying for two weeks to get someone to return their call or to get someone to take their call. Uh, I'm inclined to believe them, especially when we did call, they called together with me on the line uh, listening. We recorded it and played it in episode 28. And um, basically, it was your typical uh, you know, gatekeeper receptionist who is saying, no, no, sorry, unavailable. All I can do is assure you that I will take another message. You know, and I don't know what, pitch it in the wastebasket? I don't know what. But um, they were obviously unreachable. And then, like I said, when I called 30 minutes later, then I got an email when I had not even identified myself. So, and the, the email said that they had spoken to the CEO. So they're unreachable when they want to be unreachable. It's very, very obvious to me. I guess I, that was their damage control. Yeah, yeah, damage control mode, but you know what? It's not honest. I mean, if you're, you at least communicate something. Communicate, there is an issue, we're aware of it, we're working on it, whatever. You don't just say, oh, he's in a meeting for two weeks straight. You know, what is this? What, is, what kind of meeting is two weeks straight without any communication? That is not cool. Not cool. All right. So uh, the answer is to that question number four about avoiding their calls is, well, I can't speak for everyone. If you have any questions or anyone else does, we're very easy to reach, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about processes via email. I cannot, however, comment on any other user accounts. We're all entitled to our privacy. Okay, basically, it's just nonsense. They're not going to respond to the fact that um, everyone's saying that they're avoiding them. <coughs> they're, um, you know, <laughs> except me. When they recognize my voice, then I get a reply that he spoke to the CEO or COO right away. But when Trade Hill or Mt. Gox, which represents whatever it is, 80, 90% of their business, mm -hmm. is trying to reach them for weeks at a time, oh, no response. All right, unavailable in a meeting. All right, number five, 
is charging the online or changing sorry changing their online pages changing your online FAQ support pages etc only after this has come to light and we showed that we showed that on the screen in episode 28 um, many use the um, Google cache to, to show mm -hmm. their web page to, to prove that they actually did change it um, on the day of that show I should have probably taken some screenshots of that. <clears throat> right. Yeah. Well, we got it on the video. We got the, We got it in the oh, show, yeah. episode 28. All you have to do is look at episode 28. It's all right there. Sure. You can see it um, the, the, in a video screenshot where we brought up their page and there was nothing referencing chargebacks. Um, every, uh, you know, I was told personally that, they, that clear transactions could not be uh, reversed way back when I opened my account and that same day. And it didn't. It said basically. It said the same thing on their website. Their support pages didn't even reference chargebacks until that day, two days ago. All right. So where were we? Question five. Oh yeah, changing the FAQ um, on the fly only after this has all come to light. They're too busy to take phone calls from people who have lost tens of thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands of of dollars during you know due to their incompetence and not telling anybody about it allegedly. Um, Yet, they have time to uh, quickly, retroactively alter, not only alter the numbers on the past statements, but alter the FAQs and support pages as if that has always been their terms of services, always been their policy, change it on the spot after it's all come to light, right? So, um, they say, the entire help section was just moved to another software service, Assistly, a few weeks ago. You know, I read this and I told Ed, I said, well, that's always the excuse, isn't it? Well, we just moved to another platform. That's why. <coughs> the fact is, it's not a few weeks ago. It was two days ago that we saw it change before our very eyes. I mean, it wasn't there, then it was. Two days ago, you could see that's when the, these, um, these lines appeared suddenly out of nowhere about uh, chargebacks and transactions can be re reversed and that there is a policy and a procedure for that, although we've never seen the policy. To my knowledge, nobody's ever been notified and had that there is some sort of a policy going on to uh, uh, deal with these chargeback situations. They say, can, they continue, this has helped a great deal streamline the communication process with our users. If there's any specific part I could provide clarification on, please let me know. This is like gobbledygook. This is just like a form letter nonsense. It sounds like a politician or a lawyer wrote it um, or a marketing person. But they're not answering. They're obviously avoiding every question. They go on. Please keep in mind any emails coming in here will receive attention. And while I can't com comment on other users or accounts, I'd be happy to assist you with any questions about processes. Yeah, except that you're avoiding all of the questions about processes. It's absolutely gobbledygook, uh, double speak. Our desire. That's my comment. <laughs> Our desire and goal is to build automated processes which streamline the education about how working with Douala and financial institutions work. As our service continues to grow, uh, as well as our us as user systems, we want to make these things as clear as possible. Thank you for your time and consideration. Have a great afternoon. Okay. So anyway, that's um, that's the end of our conversation so far. The thing is that um, the questions still remain. The questions have not been answered. Um, what the world wants to know is, um, what are you doing? You know, what are you doing here? Why are you avoiding these questions? Number one, stating all along that clear transactions are irreversible. Number two, bring that up on my screen, will you? Number one, stating all along that clear transactions are irreversible. Number two, reversing old posted and clear transactions on old statements and telling no one. Number three, communicating the, that, the fact not communicating that fact that you're doing that to the affected merchants. And number four, being unreachable to your customers for weeks at a time, avoiding their calls. Number five, changing the online FAQ support pages, terms of service, things like that, only after all of this has come to light. Okay, so these are the questions. And um, the, you know, the, the audience and your customers and the Bitcoin community, which you know, I don't care what you think about Bitcoin, you can think Bitcoin is uh, absolute morons who are buying truckloads of bananas that are just going to rot in the shipping yard. If that's what you think, that's what you think. We, no, we don't care. We really don't care what you think. The fact is that your business is reliant on Bitcoin because the vast majority of your business is the Bitcoin community. And if you show that much disrespect and disregard 
for your customers, it's going to come back to bite you. I mean, it's just, that's the way it is. I don't care what. I mean, you should either ban them from being customers, but if you're going to take their money, you're going to do business with them, then you, you better treat them with respect. And that's not treating them with respect. Um, your disdain is apparent. All you have to do is read his blog posts and you can see where he's coming from. Okay. Um, it's, it's just absolutely uncool. These five questions have obviously been completely avoided. You're avoiding the questions, you're not taking phone calls, you're not doing interviews, you're hiding under the rug like a scared little cat. And that is not cool. Okay, that's not the solution. Like I said in my open letter, you know, this is, this is really, this can, I can totally see this making or breaking Bitcoin. I'm not Bitcoin, sorry, Dwala. <laughs> As I said in my open letter, the, um, this is not the solution. You can't just hide under the rug like a, you know, like a scared cat. You really have to face the situation. It's not appropriate. It's not cool. Your customers are not going to be around. And, um, you know, this will make or break Dwala. I, this is my prediction anyway. I believe it. Um, you know, Dwala, everybody loves Dwala. They love the technology. They love the ability to, uh, to use it to get, you know, to get their stuff in and out of the exchange sites and, and merchants and so on. But if Dwala shows so much disdain for their customers, and if the, any of these allegations are true, then, you know, that's not, I mean, I can understand if, you were, if you're taken off guard, okay, and the, the software broke, the systems broke down, you weren't anticipating this kind of fraud, whatever it is, but you don't hide it. You don't lie about it. You definitely don't go back and play the shredder game and try and change past transactions. And if you do do that, you certainly don't do that without telling anybody. Th that's just like a game a child would play. Uh, really, like a six-year-old would probably know better if they're raised right. It's just not appropriate. And I don't know. I mean, this is just, these are just alleged allegations. What I, what I read, obviously, I had the text on the screen. So the words that I was showing on the screen were their actual letters. The rest were my own comments and interjections. But um, in my opinion, if these allegations are true, it's very, very, very bad. It does not look good for Dwala. I have uh, repeatedly asked for them for a, a statement. That text is the only statement that I could get. And it obviously was avoiding the questions. It was avoiding all the questions. So, you know, it, it just doesn't look good. It just doesn't look good. All right, so let me take a break really quick because we have to thank our sponsors. And um, we, we love to thank our sponsors because without them, we wouldn't be here. So what I want you to do is uh, get on your computer, type in these websites, send off an email, and thank them for supporting The Bitcoin Show and Only One TV because we love being here. We love bringing you all the latest stuff, you know. Good, bad, or indifferent, you know, we're here for you, and we love you guys. We love Bitcoin. We love you, the Bitcoin community, and our viewers, and uh, we love our sponsors because without them, we wouldn't be here. So, usgoldcoins.com, 1-800-HOT-COIN, is Andy Gauss. He's the host of The Real World of Money. As I, you guys know this by heart, you could recite it. Andy Gauss is the, uh, the monetary expert of the world, in my opinion. He knows more about money than, than anyone I know. If I had any questions about money, monetary systems, he's the guy. But not only that, he owns a business. He's absolutely trustworthy. I mean, no matter what happens, um, you know, I, I, proven time again in my own experience as a customer myself, um, he's very, very honest and has the highest integ integrity and extremely knowledgeable and fair. So his name is Andy Gauss and his company is called usgoldcoins.com. This is not one of these fly-by-night, you know, um, cash for gold, nonsense things, nothing like that. He sells rare coins, gold, US gold and co silver coins as investments. He's an expert. He's not trying to buy your, your gold, you know, jewelry for cheap. It's nothing like that. He's actually selling these things as an investment, and he's an expert. And he asked, actually, you know, you listen to his radio show, uh, which, by the way, The Real World of Money is coming to only one TV every Wednesday at 10 a.m. soon. Um, and he, he talks about everything. You, you, your home might be in foreclosure or this or that, and he can give you advice about how to actually stop the foreclosure, things like that. 
and he is the coolest guy. You can literally call him. If you're in the U.S., 1-800-HOT-COIN is the number, or just go to usgoldcoins with an S dot com, usgoldcoins.com, and send him an email. But you can reach him on the phone, and he'll answer your questions. I, I, had a, I have a friend in Florida that was in that situation, and I referred him. He called up, and he, had, he said he talked to him for like 45 minutes and gave him the best advice ever and saved his home. I mean, this is wow. the kind of guy this is. He's not just there to sell you sell you the you know US gold coins you know the US uh, gold and silver rare coins that's his business but he's a really really cool accessible down to earth guy I totally vouch for him we love Andy Gauss uh, usgoldcoins.com okay and Mezzy Grill see I can go on and on about these people because I love them these are my friends and these are my people and they're your people too by extension all right Mezzy Grill oh my gosh what can I say Mezzy Grill you know M-E-Z-E Grill.com check out their menu just look at the pictures of the food and look at the pictures of the place it's just a beautiful place I mean it's not five-star dining sit-down service it's it's like uh, kind of like a Chipotle, but much more upscale, clean, and really nice atmosphere. No, they don't have burritos. It's not Mexican. No, <laughs> it's not Chipotle. But what it is is uh, Mediterranean food, which is super, super healthy. As you, if you read about that stuff, you'll know they, they're the healthiest people in the world because of the types of food that they eat. It's delicious, wholesome organic, locally grown as much as possible, and all that, um, super healthy. They now serve breakfast in addition to lunch and dinner, and they are the world's first brick and mortar um, restaurant to accept Bitcoin. So that's their claim to fame until now. Recently, I think we broke the news yesterday, mm -hmm. they now not only do they accept Bitcoin for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but they also are an exchange site. So they're the, the world's first retail store, or you might call it you know, call a brick and mortar outlet, if you don't mm -hmm. wanna call it a store, whatever, it's a restaurant. But you can actually go in there and buy Bitcoins for cash, or sell Bitcoins for cash. Say you've got so many Bitcoins and you wanna sell you know, $500 worth, you can literally go in there with your Bitcoins on your smartphone or your laptop or whatever, and you can give them Bitcoins and they'll give you cash. I, I mean, think that's I so that cool. My lunch. Yeah, absolutely. Now and, and then buy some bitcoins. Right, I and need they, some food. That's it. There you go. You can go there. And it, the, now their their deal right now, uh, as they've stated, it is a five hundred dollars per day, five hundred dollars worth of bitcoin transactions per person per day, and the fee is six percent in either direction. And um, what's the Mount other Gox thing? Mt. Gox last price. Yes, that's right. The the rate is Mt. Gox last price on either direction. So it's the same both ways. Um, fee 6%, $500 limit per day, and that's fair. Don't email them and ask them to negotiate the rates because they don't have time for that. It's a restaurant, okay, give them a rate. The, the fees are non-negotiable, the rate's non-negotiable, and the limit is not negotiable but it's super convenient. So you can go there. If you need more than $500, then go there for lunch two days in a row. You can just go there every day and get $500 every day if you want, but that's the deal. They're the world's first brick and mortar retail outlet that uh, buys and sells Bitcoin as well as accepts Bitcoin. So Mezzy Grill, they're our Bitcoin heroes. And TradeHill.com, oh my God, TradeHill, you know our buddies, they're, they're, <laughs> they're probably our most frequent guests on the show because mm -hmm. these guys are based in Chile, but they're like American, uh, American guys and there's, they have a, a team of experts. These guys are really, really knowledgeable and they have created the, the most amazing uh, Bitcoin exchange site where you can actually buy and sell Bitcoins online uh, obviously, with uh, buying it through an online site, you've got to get your money to them. So you have to use something like a bank wire transfer to them or a Dwala or some, some sort of method to get the money to them and back. Um, they're not accepting Dwala at the moment. They're you not accepting Dwala, right? Cash out to Dwala, though. Okay, yeah. So they're, they're letting you withdraw from Dwala, but they're not accepting input from Dwala. Can't blame them with the situation as per the topic of today's show. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, as far as online exchange sites go, they have lots of features and lots of benefits, instant more ways buy, to get... Instant buy, instant sell. Instant buy, instant sell, easy, convenient. They have a US dollar exchange and they also have a completely separate Euro exchange, which the other sites, to my knowledge, don't have. You, in other words, if you have Euros anywhere in Europe and you have Euros, and, or actually anywhere in the world, if you have Euros, you can send them to Trade Hill and just buy and sell Bitcoins in the Euro market without having to pay those expensive exchange fees that the banks charge to convert them into dollars, put them into the dollar market, buy and sell, and then convert them back into Euros and stuff. It's, that's nonsense. So they have an actual, uh, what would you call it, like an organic mm -hmm. Uh, market. Euro market, right? Mm -hmm. It's actually native, native Euro market. So you don't have to do any conversions to and from the Euro. All right. 
thankyoutradehill.com, and mtgox.com. We call it mtgox. Some people call it mtgox, but it's mtgox.com. Mount Gox has also um, euros, Great British, Great Britain pounds, Australian dollars, Canadian dollars coming soon. They take euros and, and those. I mean, they, they only have a U.S. dollar market, but um, they can accept euros, British pounds, Australian dollars, and Canadian dollars. And then, of course, the bank converts them into U.S. dollars for the actual market, but at least they can accept it. So there's that. And also, they have a special deal going on. Um, Basically, their fees are on sale 0.3% now through August 9th, which is really cool. Right up till uh, 10 days before the Bitcoin World Conference or Conference and World Expo, which is August 19th to 21st. Anyway, um, by the way, they're going to be presenting some really cool stuff. I think everybody is presenting some really cool new products and technologies, hardware, software, all like kinds of gadgets today. and gizmos um, at the... Um, Bitcoin Conference and World Expo in New York City, hosted right here at Only One TV, August 19th, 20 and 21. Um, anyway, MountGox.com, very innovative. Um, they're here to stay. They're very resilient. No matter what happens, they're in it for the long run. And uh, we give them a lot of kudos for that. And obviously, send them an email. Thank them for supporting Only One TV and the Bitcoin Show. So, what do we make of this whole Douala situation? What do you guys in the chat room think about it? Um, I mean, it's certainly, they should just never be in Kimonokato, you know, they, they have to, um, at least state what they're doing or what's happened or we discovered this discrepancy or something like that. Because when you're dealing with money and you're a money transmittal business like they are, it's very important for the confidence of the customers and, you know, everybody that's using them. Mm -hmm. Like you said, it could possibly make or break them. But um, regarding to the blog post, um, I'm not sure if he was like disdain for the Bitcoin community. I think he just wants to distance himself because he's not sure of the legality. But again, you know, there should be some communication. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, there's, I don't, it, he doesn't say anything about the legality. I mean, there, there's, Bitcoin is completely legal as far as anybody knows in the United States and a everywhere as far as we know. Mm -hmm. The Bitcoin itself, um, there's absolutely no precedent for it to be illegal at this point. I mean, nobody can predict what future laws there are, but he might just think that it's crazy. Like the guy from Wired Magazine who just said, it's a crazy, wacky currency. You know, he doesn't understand it. Well, let's face it. Um, when you look at it, eBay doesn't have like the warmest feelings for Craigslist. Why do you suppose that is? Because eBay's biggest competitor in the world is not only is Craigslist, but eBay is a multi you know billion dollar corporation. It's a you know uh, an empire really. It's not just one exchange site. They own many things, mm -hmm. and their biggest competitor in the world is free. eBay charges exorbitant rates that are just unbelievable. Ridiculous. And Ridiculous, and it's just to me, it's absolutely a ripoff, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it obviously people worthwhile. agree to pay it, then then it's not a ripoff. But mm -hmm. um, the thing is that it's there are exorbitant rates that I'm not willing to pay. I'll just leave it like that. Um, Craigslist is free, and that's their biggest competitor. So I I see it like that. If you're uh, PayPal, or if you're um, you know if you're PayPal or you're Dwala or something like that, and you're charging fees now, Dwala's fees are minimal; they're twenty five cents. Um, PayPal's are uh, exorbitant compared to that, but when your biggest competitor is Bitcoin, is free, you know, there's just no comparison. They, they can, I, you know, I can imagine that they're concerned too, because Bitcoin could easily replace PayPal or Dwala in the future, and that's kind of scary when you're, imagine if, uh, if PayPal's biggest, uh, let's see, if PayPal's biggest competition, or no, eBay, if eBay's biggest uh, customer, if eBay's biggest customer was Craigslist, mm -hmm. it'd be kind of like that. Like they would be very upset. If Dwala's massive proportion of their market is actually Bitcoin, you know, the, the technology of Bitcoin, that's got to be very disconcerting. It's got to be very upsetting to them because, because they're dependent on that economy. They're dependent on them. Bitcoin, which is just kind of like the shoe that could just step on them like an ant. Because Bitcoin, once it gets, once the systems are in place. Bitcoin won't need Dwala. Let's face it. Bitcoin won't need Dwala. Once everybody has Bitcoin, then everybody's an exchanger. Bitcoin will not need Dwala. Won't need PayPal. Won't need bank wires. Won't need any of that. 
So it's got to be very upsetting <laughs> if they think it through, you know. How are they going to compete with something that's about to replace them? There's that. And I understand that. So, you know, he's not going to say he's in love with Bitcoin or anything like that. Certainly not. Um, on the other hand, um, you, it's just you just don't do this. You, you can't. These are not business practices that are acceptable. Hiding behind a phone, uh, receptionist, and... Uh, if it's true, I mean, I have to say these are allegations. We've given them every opportunity, every opportunity to uh, respond to these allegations, but they basically don't admit or deny it. They just talk a whole bunch of double speak, blah 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 blah, uh, banking regulations, blah 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 blah, making things easier, blah 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 blah. Nothing. It's just a whole bunch of no double speak nothingness. They didn't answer any of the questions at all that I posed. So. It's just a bunch of nonsense to me. So, I mean, once again, it just keeps adding to the questions. You know, somebody said, uh, we read in one of the forums that someone had uh, asked them about, asked them directly about the Trade Hill situation, and they said, um, they actually said that uh, someone at, at Douala had said that Trade Hill was uh, inappropriately approving transactions and selling products to people who, um, who are transactions that had not cleared yet. And, you know, oh my gosh, once again, it's just an allegation. We don't know. Yeah. But if that's true, that's even worse. Like that particular blogger said, well, that just adds libel and slander to their list of, of uh, possible complaints, mm -hmm. if that's true. But once again, I mean, how do we know what's true if they're not willing to actually stand up and answer these questions? And no, nobody's asking for any specific account information or private things like that. No, they, we just want to know in a broad sense. The whole Douala user base, the whole, your whole customer base wants to know in a broader sense what's really going on. Why are so many people claiming that this... Uh, this is, you know, that, that these are things are happening, and they 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 seem to co collaborate. I mean, corroborate each other's mm -hmm. stories. You know, it's really a fiasco, and they need to actually address it. I don't. They don't have to appear on my show or anything like that. So but they, they don't have a public to. Public statement or a yeah, blog post. Yeah, exactly. Something. They need to at least do a press release and really answer these points straight on, because otherwise I really see it as the death of, of Dwala. I mean, I, that's my prediction, because if, they, if Dwala were to lose all credibility and lose 90% of its customers, I don't see a small startup like that recovering. It's certainly possible, mm -hmm. uh, but I do hope that, you know, they make some effort to give some sort of communication, <coughs> even if they believe or they're so dead set on the mindset, you know, that they didn't do anything wrong, you know, at least come out and support your claim mm -hmm. that nothing wrong was done. You know, the most important part is to have communication in there so, you know, the public knows what's going on. Right. I mean, you know, um, somebody in the chat room is saying, you know, multiple exchanges have declared the problems. That's exactly right. That's what I've been saying. It's not just one. I mean, if you were only hearing the story from one person, uh, you know, it's not just Trade Hill. You know, now we hear that Market Gox has said, you know, they have more than 20,000 transactions uh, with Dwala and that, uh, you know, he hasn't actually told us an amount or anything, but he has said blocks of transactions in the past have just gone missing. That's the same thing Trade Hill is saying. And a lot of other exchanges are saying to some extent or another. You know, some of them have said that they have much more security in place and that they're doing a lot more manual. You know, if you're a small exchange, if, if you're a brand new exchange and you only have seven bitcoins in your daily volume, okay, well, anybody can do that. I can go and visit the person and make sure that that's a real account. But um, when you're talking about millions of dollars a week of transactions, it's a whole nother story. You're at a whole completely different scale. And nobody can personally call up each person and verify that they're a US citizen and that they are who they say they are and stuff like that. Um, the, um, the other thing is, let's see, someone was saying, oh, it, <laughs> someone's saying that the, the Dwella horse is dead and Bruce keeps beating it. Well, you know, it's, uh, I don't know. If it, was, if it was a half a million dollars of your money, you might not be saying that. You know, and who knows? Maybe it is. Who knows? 
Who knows? Maybe you have money in these exchange sites and maybe it isn't there anymore because of this. We don't know. I mean, they're going to, I'm sure they're auditing it and, you know, hopefully everyone will be doing the right thing and the truth will come out. But look, if they're, I don't care if they're Eastern European hackers that have somehow gotten compromised, US bank accounts, whatever, whatever, and they put the money in, they sent it to, through Dwala to an exchange site, they bought the Bitcoins, took the Bitcoins out, reversed the transaction, they figured out how to play the game. But here's the thing. If people were robbed, whether it was $30,000 or $500,000 worth, if people were robbed, somebody was robbed, somebody has to make up that difference. So, you know, who's out? Is it the bank, the original bank? Is it Dwala? Or is it the exchange site? We know it's not the crook because if he already got the Bitcoins, they're gone. You know, um, now Mark I'm not said that uh, I, I think he's had like, uh, no loss or very minimal loss because um, he's actually frozen the withdrawals on those accounts. He was able to track the uh, the accounts that where this had happened and he froze withdrawals. You know, okay, so you froze withdrawals and now you got a whole other investigation process to go through. I don't, I do not envy his job at all. But um, but what do you think? You know, tell us in the chat room if you're watching this on tape. Send us an email to bitcoin at onlyonetv.com. By the way, that's our new feedback email address. So whenever you're watching the Bitcoin show and you have a comment, um, if it's, especially if it's not live, if it's live, just go to the, click the live button on onlyonetv.com and put it in the chat room. But if it's not live, just email us at bitcoin at onlyonetv.com and give us your feedback, your comments. We love to hear from you. And uh, if it's really juicy, we'll read it on the air and answer your questions. But what do you think? Are we, are we beating a dead horse here? Or um, I mean, is this, is this really uh, justify further discussion? Um, I think we need to put it out there because, you know, Dwala is not putting anything out publicly, publicly, so we should do our job as reporters and, you know, report what we're seeing and what we're reading and, you know, try to get some communication out there. But, you know, I'm just really waiting to see what they have to say on it all. Right. Is it's certainly not cool in any sense of the word to, you know, be silent when things like this are happening or not even notifying one of your larger merchants. So um, mm. I don't know why they would do that. You know, they could have prevented this whole thing mm. just from sending a quick email or spending five minutes on the phone with Jared at Trade Hill or, or Adam at Trade Hill. You know, they could have certainly prevented this and they had the power to do so. So I don't know why they chose not to use that power. Mm -hmm. Okay, Johnny in the, in the chat room is saying, if exchanges don't accept Dwala, Dwala fails. I don't think the community has to get all excited about it. Okay, well, you know, from your standpoint, maybe not. Maybe you haven't even used Dwala. Maybe you don't even have a Dwala account. It, you might have money in a Dwala account. You might have used Dwala and it worked just fine. But here's the thing. If the exchanges are losing thousands or tens of thousands or God knows hundreds of thousands of dollars, that affects you. I don't care what, you, you, you may not realize it, but if the exchanges are losing lots of money like that, uh, guess what? That's your money. If you have any money in the exchanges, that's your money. I mean, you know, Trade Hill doesn't lose $40,000 and then like, whose money do you think that is? That's the depositor's money. That's mm -hmm. not cool. It's absolutely, it absolutely brings instability to the entire Bitcoin uh, infrastructure because, you know, Dwala could, uh, these types of problems, put it this way, these types of problems could have far-reaching implications on all the exchanges that have accepted Dwala and have been burned. So it might not affect you directly or you think it doesn't, but it really does affect the whole infrastructure. Steven says, um, Dwala is based on ACH uh, technology invented in 1972. They were selling something they couldn't actually deliver uh, because of the inherent in, uh, install or limitations of ACH, of course. Yeah, and you know, I saw this when, when I first understood what Dwala was. I was like, they're using ACH? I mean, how? How are they doing that? I thought they must have some new secret technology, some secret magic mm -hmm. recipe that actually allows them to do ACH without any chargeback liability because I've never heard of ACH without at least a 60-day chargeback liability anywhere. And they... Um, there, you know, how can they possibly do that and guarantee that clear yeah. transactions won't you, get reversed? You know what it might have been also? It might have been on their part not communicating clearly enough that it specifically, you know, has some provisions in place for refunding of transactions or that it has um, 
anything at all or even you know training their their employees to know what the proper procedures are and getting that information out to everybody mm -hmm. because you know maybe they were just hoping there wouldn't be that much fraud on there and they could just eat the cost and then maybe they realized like they bargained way too much and here's the <laughs> you know from a consumer's perspective that you know okay whatever it is what it is I mean, you haven't lost any money directly Jessica wants to know what are people going to use instead of Dwala and that's a really key thing Dwala I mean you know it's kind of like <sighs> I guess it's kind of like being an Indian giver when something is so great and everybody quickly jumps on it and then all of a sudden there's a failure of trust about it. If people, if the whole Bitcoin community loses trust in Dwala, what are people going to use instead of Dwala? I mean, we're going to go back to bank wires. Um, you know, <laughs> Johnny it's says... It's temporary too. And there's going to be something to replace it. Hopefully something else will replace it, but not if it's based on ACH. They're all going to have the same kind of problems or else they're going to charge exorbitant fees and we're going to end up with PayPal uh, and chargebacks. Pay, you know, exorbitant fees and chargebacks, which is what we have with credit cards and PayPal. Johnny says, Mezzi Grill. What are people going to use instead of Dwala? Mezzi Grill. Well, $500 a day, there you go. Um, maybe pe friends and, fa you know, Facebook. There's actually a page on Facebook called uh, I sell Bitcoin for cash or something like that. If you go to Facebook and type in sell Bitcoin for cash, you'll find it. Mm -hmm. And I've seen people are liking that page and then looking among their personal friends and family and friends of friends and family of friends and so on, uh, their personal Facebook network and finding people who buy and sell Bitcoin. And that's a way to do it right there. Because if you buy uh, Bitcoin from people you know, then you've got your local, I mean, you've got... <laughs> What kind of web of trust is that? You can buy it from your sister or your sister's boyfriend or your, you know, whatever, your brother's roommate. <laughs> whatever the case may be. Um, people are still in, what is this? They're saying people are still in denial. Uh, what else are they saying? They lied. Uh, <laughs> the chat room is saying they lied. Um, anything else? Let's see. People use checks, wire, ING direct, pop money, uh, and EXCHB. You're well, in IRC? No, no, no. I'm in the chat room. I'm, I'm, oh. scrum, I'm way back. I'm right behind. Oh. Uh, I guess Dwala like are the modern minutes. day Apaches. Mm -hmm. We have like three minutes. Yeah. Well, seven. seven? Eight, six. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. Then the fourth one fails. Dwala works the same way. Um, where are you going to have me if you keep turning up? Oh, the half a million. Oh, yeah, Scott wants to know, Bruce, where are you getting that half a million dollar figure you keep coming up with? Well, okay, it's just an if. We don't know, but here's where I'm getting that. According to Trade Hill, uh, about 2.5% of their June transactions were actually uh, subsequently secretly reversed and disappeared. So 2.5% of their money just disappeared and evaporated. So if you take the volume that Mt. Gox did, you know, Mt. Gox has, hasn't come out with all these uh, figures publicly, but if you take the amount of volume that Mt. Gox did with Dwala, which he, um, Mark did post publicly in a forum, and you just reverse engineer that percentage, we're saying if, we don't know, but hypothetically, if Mt. Gox uh, s lost a similar percentage, 2.5%, mm -hmm. of uh, their transactions for that same period, that four to six week period, then that could amount to close to $500,000. That's serious, serious money. And the question is, who is going to pay it? You know, does, does Dwala have that much? Does, does Dwala have that much in investment capital that they can just cover, you know, $550,000 or whatever it is? You make up any number you want. That's I don't care if it's 5000 or 550000 Whatever that X number is, does Dwala have that much in their coffers that they can just cover that? Mm -hmm. I mean, does Trade Hill, does Mt. Gox? Somebody Do, has to absorb it. It's more somebody, than whatever profit it, they're making. That's the thing. Somebody has to absorb that loss. And the question is, who's going to absorb it? Who's going to be honest about it? The truth will come out. You, like I always say, you cannot lie to the Internet. Don't even try. Don't try to lie to the Internet because you will be called out. You know, and, you know, communication is king. If you talk and explain that you made a mistake and you apologize, well, people will forgive you. I mean, they might not send you their money right away. You have to earn that trust back. But if you lie, hide, you know, and try and reverse history and things like that, it may have worked in the dark ages, but uh, not in the days of the Internet. It just doesn't work. 
So um, anyway, there you have it. There's the latest update on the Douala situation. I mean, it, to me, it's very, very sad, um, a sad state of affairs. I mean, I love Douala. I promoted it. I created a video. The best way, the easiest way, not the best maybe, but the easiest way to buy Bitcoin was using Douala mm -hmm. at the time. So I created a whole video and told people, I recommended people buy, use Douala and put their money into the trade, you know, Trade Hill and, and Mt. Gox and buy their Bitcoin that way. But uh, now, obviously, Trade Hill doesn't even accept Douala now. And there's going to be, I, I just, the repercussions are going to be vast. Because, you know, if Douala is completely out of the Bitcoin picture, I mean, Douala itself, I don't know, maybe it'll fail. Um, mm -hmm. Regardless of that, though, Bitcoin's not going to fail, but something else is going to replace it. They'll have, but the, whole, the Bitcoin world is going to lose a very valuable tool. Yeah, because it allows one of the fastest ways to actually get into Bitcoin exchanges using Douala. Mm -hmm, exactly. So it's a sad day for Bitcoin, but Bitcoin has survived worse. And uh, Bitcoin is here to stay. So that's this, the answer. I mean, until we uh, hear more, uh, that's the latest. And as you know, we will uh, be right on it as news breaks here at the Bitcoin Show. And um, so we're out of time. We have talked another hour away. Uh, but thanks for joining us live on the Bitcoin Show. Thank um, you. Every day, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, Monday through Friday, and sometimes more often than that. When there's breaking news, we're here for you. So go to onlyonetv.com, click on subscribe, and uh, you can also subscribe via YouTube and iTunes and pretty much every single screen there is out there. Um, but stay with us. Give us feedback. Let us know your thoughts. Email bitcoin at onlyonetv.com. That's bitcoin at onlyonetv.com, all spelled out. Thanks for joining us. See you. Same Thank time you. tomorrow. Take care. All right. Love you.